I, I guess the title to this talk is an overview on civil culture's effects, of forestry, forest management's effects on elk habitat, and the relationships among habitat, productivity, and disease. But the reality is that's a, a humongous subject. It would take, um, you know, a, a seminar and, and, and a long time to really cover that adequately. So I'm going to paint with some broad brush strokes, and I'm going to provide a lot of resources in this talk that you can go do additional research and reading to, to maybe get more down in the nuts and bolts. And again, you can reach out to me and contact me and we can discuss it more in depth. Um, and I'm also gonna have a major emphasis on Western Washington and Southwest Washington. Um, that works great for this group, but it doesn't always work great for other groups. So that's another reason why I was excited to give this talk. Um, and, and like Paula said, I'm going to I'm going to cover habitat and elk habitat and some of these relationships with population dynamics or you know what we see in the population over time and i'm going to try to kind of tie some of these concepts together with a bit of a case study on on hoof disease and some of the things that we've learned from research we've done at the department on um, elk in mount st helens and how, I guess, you know, habitat and nutrition tie into management of elk, and in, and in this case, may tie into the management of treponema-associated hoof disease, which I'll just refer to basically as hoof disease during this talk. So uh, to, to go ahead and jump in here, it looks like my computer's maybe going a little slow. All right, there we go. So I think probably all of us are, are pretty well aware of, of what elk are and how they look. Um, and in Washington, we're really quite blessed to have two subspecies of, of elk in this state. We have Roosevelt elk in southwestern Washington and the Olympic Peninsula. And in other areas, herd areas of the state, we predominantly have Rocky Mountain elk. And they're with some intermixing of those two subspecies where they meet. Um, elk at one point in our history were largely extirpated from all but the most rugged areas, essentially the Olympic Peninsula. Um, but now we're uh, uh, sitting on a population of anywhere from maybe 45, 55 to 60,000 animals statewide, depending on, you know, kind of what's going on that year, or that you know, few years that we are able to do surveys. And of course, um, you know, elk are really uh, highly valued species for uh, Washingtonians and people across the West for their cultural, um, aesthetic, and recreational um, value, and, and uh, also importantly, their economic value to the state. So understanding things about what limits elk or what might produce more elk, um, and in general, how to manage elk is, you know, fundamentally sort of an important task for us in the state. And, as the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And of course, you can't have elk without elk habitat. And, um, you know, habitat can be defined in a lot of ways and can be looked at very, in a very sophisticated ways. But essentially, this is pretty common sense. It's an area where the needs for an elk uh, are met through its, uh, you know, nutritional needs. Its food is there. Uh, it has water, obviously, and it has shelter, not unlike any other animal or us, really. Um, and elk are really a highly adaptable species that can exist in a very diverse habitat types, not only in Washington, of course, but you can think of elk existing in arid areas and desert areas of the southwest and um, all the way to the Olympic Peninsula where we, we have record levels of rainfall. In Washington, you uh, can see photos here of sort of some of the areas where we might even find elk that are very diverse. So you have sort of this sagebrush steppe, scab land almost in, in eastern Washington and areas of central and north central Washington. As a kid from Montana, when I think elk habitat, I think what we see in this sort of center photo of these uh, grasslands, a bit of prairie with intermixed conifer stands. Um, a, a drier landscape of what we might see in central Washington. And then of course, for those of us in Western Washington, I forgot to mention, I'm, I'm based out of Olympia, um, where we might think of elk habitat out here and folks in, in Pierce County, we, we might think of this sort of wet dug fir Western hemlock stand with intermixed sort of meadows. Um, and today's talk, uh, again, will we'll mostly focus in on some of 
uh, what we know about elk habitat in these sort of western west slope cascades uh, uh, habitats from research that's really been done uh, over the last 20 or more years it's just a really great body of literature that i can only barely skim the surface of um, and and of course also because of this tie-in with with hoof disease and what we know about hoof disease and how habitat may be playing a role in the dynamics of that disease. So in Western Washington, um, we, you know, uh, of course, elk can exi exist in a, in a large variety of habitats here as well, just in the sort of more narrow scale where um, in this upper left photo, we have a, a very standard agriculturally dominated lowland valley that's uh, bookended by um, private industrial timberland or even public uh, timberland, as you see there. Um, we've got large tracts of federal or state land that's, that's managed at varying levels of uh, intensity. You see maybe a representative example here on the bottom left of, of Mount St. Helens and uh, the National Monument, that Tootle River, River drainage. And then, um, of course, on the right here, where it's sort of what, what I often think of when I think of elk habitat in, in southwest Washington, um, you know, is this industrial timberland where you have this uh, mosaic of, of very intensively managed forest land and tracts of forest land. As you can kind of see in these photos, um, you know, when we think about elk habitat, you know, well, geez, I see a lot of green out there. And uh, green means plants and plants means food because elk are herbivores. Uh, and, you know, outside of that, that top left photo where there is quite a bit of green that would be really, really great for elk and cause a lot of damage and consternation to those landowners, those producers, a lot of the other areas um, where we find uh, maybe potential elk habitat the vegetation that exists is uh, really not all that great for elk, you know. So one question, I, well, why, we have unlimited green. You know, I remember once I went to Alaska and I was like, oh, geez, there's green everywhere. Why aren't there animals? Just absolutely everywhere. And uh, when I was at, you know, I was, like, I was in high school, and the reason why is that not all plant, you know, not all plants, not all forage items are created equal in their palatability and their nutritional value for elk. Um, and I apologize if a lot of this may be coming across as common sense uh, to folks, but want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page here. So plants that are really common in a lot of these areas, Western Washington, uh, things like, you know, of course, conifers and ferns and Oregon grape, you know, these are pretty low value for, for elk. Um, and rather, elk would much rather prefer uh, to consume, you know, uh, nice green grasses, uh, post-winter green up, and the forbs that come along uh, soon thereafter, and the shrubs that are available seasonally. Those are really highly nutritious, easily digestible components. You know, these are broad brush strokes. Every species is a little bit different. We, we can't, we don't have the time to maybe get down into those weeds, but um, that's just to say that there's sort of considerable plasticity in the diet of elk um, and in and, and what they might prefer and that isn't always represented in some of these areas in Washington. And that kind of explains some of those broader meta scale dynamics of, you know, why elk are doing well in one area and they're not doing well in the other areas. So where do we find these highly valuable forage items? Um, you know, that the, the grasses and the shrubs and the forbs um, <clears throat> are these, uh, what are called early cereal states. Of course, I'm talking to a group of foresters. I always, I kind of hope I don't sound super foolish to, 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 to speak forestry to, to actual foresters. I'm a biologist pretending to be a forester at this moment. But um, this figure I really like, and I think it really kind of shows us what we're dealing with. Where in the early, um, the early uh, period of a cereal, uh, of a uh, early, early cereal periods of a timber stand, uh, really those first 10 to 15 years post disturbance where we see um, a lot of sun, uh, solar radiation, a lot of sunlight hitting the ground. Uh, it allows for those palatable species to grow and become more abundant. Those are really good areas for elk for their foraging. Uh, but of course, it's not the only thing and this figure kind of shows you is there's, there's foraging areas. And then there's cover areas. And I think that's an important concept where it's not just about food, of course, although, you know, the idea of, of cover 
um, might sometimes be a little bit exaggerated and it kind of, it's sort of context dependent, you know, elk don't necessarily need it for thermal cover as much as I might need it for security cover to, to evade hunters or predators of, of some kind. So these early successional stands are, are, are really great for, for forage. And as the stand grows older, after that 15 year period or so, it begins to close um, and there's just less forage available in there. And those early cereal stands, of course, historically created by things like natural disturbance. You know, these are, are massive wind storms or uh, fires that happened more intermittently than we see them now. Um, or, and perhaps I think, you know, kind of a, the most dramatic fashion that I can think of uh, naturally occurring is a volcanic eruption like we saw at Mount St. Helens that really created a tremendous amount of early cereal, uh, early cereal stands. Today, of course, and for quite some time, uh, timber harvest and its associated management and practices, civil cultural practices, are what have been creating the majority of these early uh, cereal stands. And of course, consequently, the uh, forest practices and forest management has really important um, and not necessarily altogether uh, straightforward influences on elk habitat. And ultimately, that habitat is determining kind of the, the population dynamics of, that, of, of the uh, elk population. So, you know, kind of highlighting a little bit of, of what these relationships might look like here. And I've got to move this, all of your pretty faces over out of the way so I can kind of explain this figure because it takes a little bit of doing. So um, first, so to try to ignore this busy page for a little bit, and I'll just say, you know, that thinning, um, not to dismiss fit, uh, thinning as an important civil cultural practice, and um, it's, it's, uh, got value for creating those conditions where solar radiation reaches the ground and it grows grass forbs, et cetera. That it is good and it is valuable. Um, I know less about its sort of direct impacts. There's a little bit less, uh, it's, it's not quite as, um, you know, pardon the sort of pun clear cut. Um, and it's really kind of just this function of how much do you open in the canopy? And one of the interesting things there is that if, you, if you're not opening the canopy a lot and you're not creating a lot of ground level disturbance, you may actually uh, inadvertently encourage the growth of those unpalatable species that they're shade tolerant, they do all right in the understory when there's canopy cover and then you open it up and you give them more solar radiation, they might actually kind of go gangbusters in there and um, outcompete some of those more palatable species for elk. As opposed to say stand replacement or clear cut logging, um, which really dramatically increases forage biomass, you know, and again, I'm painting broad brush strokes here, but that's a pretty, you know, pretty solid rule. You say you cut down, you know, a 20 acre stand of timber, you open it up to sunlight. Um, a lot of, a lot of good plant species are going to regenerate in that early stage. And that's going to, those are going to be of high value for elk. That's a pretty low risk thing for me to say. And one of the ways to sort of illustrate this is now we can kind of look um, at, at this figure on the right, and I'll give this sort of example here from some of the work that um, John and Rachel Cook and others have done. These are, these are folks that are kind of um, paragons of, of elk nutrition and understanding elk nutrition and, and how it ties into these population level effects. Um, they showed in, in this paper that you know, in these early stands these five to ten years post logging three to five thousand kilograms a, a hectare of biomass versus 100 to 300 kilograms in 20 to 50 year old stands and so that's just kind of showing and really driving home this idea that a stand grows older and the canopy closes that's a window where the forage value is really diminishing for elk it's not invaluable it can be very you know important that security covers not to be dismissed but it doesn't it won't have a lot of forage value. Um, and so what this figure here on the right is showing us, so the top is summer biomass in the understory, and the bottom is autumn fall biomass in the understory of forage plants for elk, okay? And uh, the, the x-axis here is time uh, in years going across. It's got kind of this staggered way of looking at it. So, you know, just 
you know, it's sort of 15 years is kind of 25%, maybe, maybe 20 years, about 25% of that X axis. And you can see there we have black, white, gray, and sort of dashed. And those represent excellent, good, marginal, and poor um, sort of density plots of, of biomass there. So what you can see is in for summer nutrition or summer forage availability on this top panel, the first, you know, one, to, there's this massive dip in that data set, but, you know, one to 15 years or so, that's where we see the excellent forage biomass. Uh, when we look at the, at, the, at the good, you know, same general pattern, marginal, same general pattern, and the poor, you know, we've got a lot of poor biomass, poor uh, meaning unpalatable or of poor nutritional value to elk. Um, you know, that, that just exists out there and, and sort of superfluously. And you see in autumn, you know, our, our forage is starting to senesce. We're getting into, you know, out of the, the really productive seasons. So a lot less of that excellent uh, biomass, got some good biomass um, and, and, and you know, getting uh, pretty, pretty standard with the marginal. And then a lot of them, you know, the, the poor biomass is just sort of out there and, and just represents quite a bit of what's in the understory, kind of regardless. Of, of time. Um, and so this, you know, as a sort of a side note, this also highlights one of the, one of the unique things about what um, the cooks and, uh, and many other folks have been working on and researching a while is that for a long time when it came to elk and other ungulates, we were really focused in on winter. And winter is this really important driver and winter nutrition and, you know, is there enough food out there in the winter for them to get through? But what we're actually learning is that summer nutrition is playing a really outsized role in the dynamics of, of elk and how well they're able to perform, meaning, you know, are they able to, to, to conceive? Are they able to, you know, recruit a calf? Are they able to be, um, you know, are they in good enough condition that they can, uh, you know, be lactators, for instance? So that summer nutrition is playing a big role and whether or not an animal is able to accrue enough body fat to make it through winter. That's a, that's a pretty important component there. And I'll talk more about nutrition and, and actual body fat levels and things here in a few slides. So to kind of take this back, um, the digestible energy intake is about two times that in early stands as it is in older age stands. For those 10 to 15 years, it's you know about twice as good uh, in terms of what's out there for elk to eat as a general sort of rule of thumb. And, it, and it's, important sort of a um, that digestible energy part is, is sort of an important uh, de uh, determination there where again there's a lot of species plant species out there that you know are available to elk but they might, might not be all that good for elk uh, they might be unpalatable or they actually might be kind of costly for an elk to consume you know maybe they can break it down they're large bodied ruminants, so they're a little bit better at, at being able to break down low digestible components of plants, but um, there's a limit to that. And so there's a sort of trade off between efficiency and, and I'm digressing a little bit there, but nonetheless, these early stands, again, uh, good for elk. And then um, this study in particular looked at, uh, you know, both low elevation and higher elevation stands. And one of the kind of, I think the interesting component here is that it, the effects, uh, the benefits of um, stand replacement, uh, clear cut logging here, persist a little bit longer in higher elevation stands than they do in lower elevation stands. So, uh, kind of bottom line, you know, underscore that you know timber harvest uh, stand replacement, you know, is 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 good for elk habitat and good for elk nutrition uh, in general. Of course, there's, there's, you know, there's always trade-offs with everything in life, and um, one of the one of the trade-offs here is that you know clear cutting, stand replacement, thinning, prescribed fire, all these things we might do to a forest stand uh, may discourage the use of that of that area of that stand by elk in the short term. Uh, you know, depending on on how extensive that disturbance was, it's it, it might be very short lived. That avoidance or it might be quite a bit longer. Um, road building, if you know, silvicultural practices and, and forest practices are, are producing roads that are then being used and traveled after the fact and, and sort of uh, are allowed to have um, uh, you know, sort of open access, 
that's a bad thing for elk. And in fact, you could, you, you might actually, you know, negate any, any real benefit um, in terms of elk use of an area. If you create a lot of good habitat and good forage, if you've got a road right next to it, you know, elk really don't like that. They don't like that road disturbance. If it's a closed road, restricted use, you know, you're probably not dealing. The road itself, I guess, is what I'm getting at. The road itself is not necessarily the problem that might result in elk avoidance, um, but the traffic on that road. And that's vehicular, that's dirt bikes, that's, you know, just people walking uh, sometimes can be enough to sort of discourage the use of an area by elk. Another one that I think is, is really interesting and something that uh, is often kind of brought up and talked about, and, and of course we, um, you know, I, I won't be surprised if this audience um, has sort of forest herbicides and things like that on their mind quite a bit, and I'm sure that you folks know quite a bit more about it than I do, but one of the interesting questions is, okay, well, stand replacement is, is good for elk in general, but what about these associated practices like um, herbicides, you know, that, that help, um, you know, folks grow their conifers and, and do their business, but it's actually actively sort of reducing the plants that are available for elk. Um, and so some folks out of um, University of Alberta, um, uh, Andrew Geary under the, the, the guidance of uh, Evelyn Merrill, along with uh, some folks, John and Rachel Cook and uh, Larry Irwin, got together and they, they did a, um, quite, some quite nice uh, research to try to get an answer to this question. And, and what they found is that, yes, herbicides, you know, applied one to two times post-harvest, these are causing an immediate reduction in the affords that's available to elk. Um, and what's left out there are at biomass levels that are, that are too low for elk to efficiently forage in. And I kind of mentioned that a little bit in the last slide where, um, there's some trade-offs there where like, there might be a little bit out there, but really an elk is going to, is not going to waste its time because it has an energetic requirement. It, it simply can't feed fast enough or consume enough across that area to, for it to be an efficient payoff for them. So that might discourage elk use. However, that impact is short-lived, um, typically on the order of less than three years. And uh, it, it sort of depends on the, on the characteristics of the specific area, that specific stand. Um, but after the, uh, the sort of the effect of herbicides and this, you know, about three year window um, elapses, the, the treated stands are quite similar in terms of biomass to untreated stands. And so I'll divert your attention now from the text to that figure here on the right, where we look on y-axis, we have biomass in, in kilograms per hectare. Um, and then the x-axis, I'll, I'll try to explain this as coherently as possible. So we see a se four series of, of two bars. And so look at only the two bars at one time. You see one that says NH and then H. The NH is no herbicides. The H is herbicide. Um, that carries through and is consistent across. And then you can see on the top here, we say one to two, three to five, six to nine, 10 to 13 years. And that's, that is time post treatment of herbicides. So uh, another, you know, there's a lot of information in this figure. I really like this figure. Another component of this is it's a stacked bar. And so in the black, you see the biomass of species that are avoided by elk. They're unpalatable. They're not really something they would prefer to consume. And then in the gray, there are species that are accepted. So those are the, those are the um, good forage items that are out there. And you can see in this, uh, in this er early one to two year period, um, the untreated stands where there are no herbicides have considerably higher uh, biomass in them overall of both avoided and, uh, and accepted species. But you can see, boy, there's, there's a decent amount. It's almost 50-50, uh, you know, avoided and accepted. There's some, there's good eats in that, in that stand compared to a stand that was treated by herbicides where we have uh, the majority of what's out there is avoided species. And uh, there's a little bit of accepted species in there. And you can see that overall, though, the biomass is considerably lower. And I think that would just sort of tell you, well, yeah, geez, herbicides really do their job. That little star above there, and I, I, I should have gone back and reviewed this paper, but I'm almost 
completely positive. That as an indication, there's a statistically significant difference between those two bars. And, and I don't think we need statistics to tell us that there is a, a pretty apparent difference there. But what you can see is three to five, six to nine years um, post-treatment that the levels of biomass that are out there sort of equate to one another. So um, in a treated stand that no herbicide, trans, no herbicide on the left and herbicides on the right, you know, there's still a little less biomass, but not significantly different. And the ratio of avoided and accepted species of biomass, you know, it looks, it looks pretty similar. Um, and that carries, that carries forward until that 10 to 13 year window where we seem to see a, a significant difference in the available biomass there. Um, I'd have to go back and review that carefully to, to offer up why that might be. But I think one important note there is that there's, there's not a lot of accepted forage that's, that's in that time period. So even then we're seeing these cereal stands closing, transitioning probably more to the security cover type and less uh, being less um, valuable as foraging areas. I think overall, um, to kind of summarize that is that, you know, the forage base is, well, no, not to summarize this part, but um, what they, one important thing that they found is that the forage base in herbicide treated stands compared to unharvested stands. So you got a stand that had a stand replacement event, you, you did some clear cutting, but just you, you, you used herbicides to um, give your, you know, your seedlings a chance to establish themselves. And then you have a stand that is not harvested, maybe it's 15, 20, 30 years old, there's still a net benefit to doing that logging. The forage base is far superior in a stand that was logged and treated than it was in a, in a stand that was not logged. Um, so that's to say maybe in a more simpler way that there's a net benefit uh, despite that reduction of forage that's caused by herbicides. So I think this is really interesting stuff and, and um, you know, Andrew Geary wrote up a couple of nice reports. This is published work, but um, there's some, there's a lot of great information in there on kind of the history and some logging regimes and things like that of, of Southwestern Washington that I would encourage folks to look at if you're interested. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but that did, that work did happen at Mount St. Helens Tree Farm. So uh, pretty relevant stuff here for, for those of us in Southwest Washington. Okay, so uh, again, painting, you know, broad brush strokes. Um, the the <clears throat> timber management and timber harvest and silvicultural practices associated with that the, the important creator of these early age stands and and those early age stands are just simply you know vital to the creation of elk habitat and forage production that are important to elk. Uh, not only here in home in southwest washington uh and western washington but really broadly across most of the range of elk. You know, I, a lot of what I'm talking about is specific to West Slope Cascades, but these concepts really do, um, you know, kind of, kind of weave through all different sort of ecosystems. So, uh, you know, with that, of course, uh, these active timberlands are playing a really important role in the population dynamics of elk. Um, elk have to eat in order to survive long enough in order to um, you know, get pregnant and have babies and bring them successfully through their first winter and recruit them into, popula into the population as productive members themselves. Um, so that's, that's really important and, and fundamental. And the private timberlands, and I think this is really, really interesting. One of the things that, um, you know, I continue to learn as a student of this and uh, someone who didn't grow up with so much private timberland, you know, that it, they're playing such an increasingly important role over the last couple of two, three decades um, due to the changes in federal forest management, federal forest practices. Just thinking of kind of like the Mount St. Helens tree, really uh, managed forest lands that, you know, aren't necessarily managed as actively as they used to. So a lot of the elk habitat is concentrated in some of these private tracks. There are some drawbacks, of course. I mentioned things like roads. Um, and uh, of course, I just you know, uh, showed you some data on the herbicide use, but the, uh, the large scale mosaic that we find of these mixed age stands across, you know, just zoom out to Southwest Washington, um, 
have a net benefit, or at least, you know, likely seem to have a net benefit and are able to support elk in numbers that we otherwise wouldn't be able to find. We wouldn't be able to sustain. Um, we would simply see really closed in uh, forest lands and very limited amount of food. We just wouldn't have the elk that we have now. Large scale application is kind of necessary to manifest the population effects. Um, this is sort of in summary of, of work that, um, you know, a few folks, the Cooks and, and some other folks at the Pacific Northwest Research Station have, have put together over um, the last couple of decades where, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can still benefit elk at a small scale and that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you've got, you know, 10 acres of trees or something that you're gonna go manage or thin out. Um, but as a, as a Department of Fish and Wildlife and thinking about how do we manage for large, robust, sustainable populations of elk, you know, we want to think about landscape scale. We want to think about um, large tracts of land that we can create this mosaic of, we've got security covers and mixed aged different serial stages that provide for the different needs that elk have. And that these disturbance events, you know, critically important to this uh, are needed continuously uh, because of course trees grow and they, they continue to grow and the canopy closes and time goes on, marches on and uh, we need to renew those early serial stages if we're to create a um, stable kind of trajectory in elk populations where, you know, we don't, we would love it if we didn't have uh, boom and bust cycles in elk because we have, you know, periods of lots of timber harvest or we have, say, in a, 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 pop, you know, a, a, a volcano uh, erupt and then we see big growth and then feedbacks from not enough habitat out there and we see the population go down. We'd rather, you know, have that mosaic out there continuously that the elk population can sustain in, in a stable way. And for those of you that are interested in maybe taking this a bit step, a step further, making this a little bit um, more sophisticated maybe and really getting into the weeds, say you've got an idea, you want to implement some, some forest uh, management on your tract, um, but you kind of want to be strategic about it. There's some really sophisticated tools that are available, um, notably out of the Pacific Northwest Research Station, some folks, um, uh, Mike Wisdom and Mary Rowland and the, and the folks that I mentioned earlier, the John and Rachel Cook and a multitude of other folks have put in decades of, of work to create this, uh, what's, what's this fancy sort of name of a spatially explicit nutritional resource selection model, uh, also called the West Side model. But really what that is, is it's, it's a model that goes in a geographic information system, a GIS, and you use it, you can use it in a multitude of ways, but you can use it to assess the habitat suitability. You can assess the probability of use by elk, and you can manipulate some factors in there. So what if you're gonna put a road in somewhere, or you're going to cut three 40 acre sections, what that might do to the probability of use. Now again, I, th this isn't necessarily the most approachable um, technique. I don't know how user friendly they've been able to make this. I haven't looked in a while, but if you're interested in that, um, you know, contact me or contact them directly at the Pacific Northwest Research Station and they can probably guide you. I imagine they're very eager to have folks implementing those resources and using those. It's probably geared a little bit more toward, um, say, forest, you know, the federal forest managers, but um, can also have some utility for other folks that are interested in trying to find this um, balance between, you know, timber management and also supporting, you know, healthy, robust elk populations. So I think I offer out some, some resources here and, you know, I, I'll share the, I can share a copy of this so folks have this. This is just a small sort of select snippet of what's out there. Um, you know, there's probably, 60 to 80 more articles that I could have put up here that would have been worthy of review. So I'll throw these out there, we can get them to you um, so you can review them at, at home. And, and if you have an interest in any of these articles and reviewing them and you can't access them because sometimes they're behind paywalls, reach out to me and I have these articles and I can get you, get you the articles if you're interested in reviewing them further. 
Okay, so move into the second uh, part of this talk where I'll, I'll attempt, I'll say that I'll attempt to try to tie in some of these concepts with um, Elkhoff disease and, and what we've seen with Elkhoff disease and what we're learning about Elkhoff disease. So I think probably the majority of folks in this audience are aware uh, of Elkhoff disease. If you're not, it's a, uh, a, a bacterial disease uh, that invades the hoof tissues of elk and uh, causes, you know, lesions, uh, deformities, is clearly a painful condition. And you can see here there's sort of characteristic classic photos of elk that have infected hooves, they hold them up, it causes a limp and an abnormal gait. Um, and, you know, of course, it, it often leads to sort of these secondary effects of you know, becoming malnourished, uh, the infection progresses, it can cause a secondary infection, and, and, it, and, and it undoubtedly, um, you know, kind of contributes to the, the demise of the animal, unless that's interrupted by, say, you know, being harvested or something like that. Um, the disease, we don't exactly know when it emerged, but it emerged probably in the early 2000s in the Boisfort Valley. That's highlighted here in this map on the left. Uh, that's the Willapaw Hills elk herd area. Um, and, you know, a number of years, maybe five to, to eight years or so after its emergence, we're not entirely sure. Again, it's kind of hard to, to, to know. Um, the disease crossed over I-5 and got into the Mount St. Helens elk herd area and the, and the core of the Mount St. Helens elk herd in that sort of, um, you know, Toodle River drainage. And, and when it got into the Mount St. Helens elk population, it really uh, spread quite dramatically in its distribution and it also increased quite dramatically in its prevalence, the number of animals that were affected by the disease, as opposed to what we saw say in the Willapaw Hills where there were definitely animals, it was, a, it was cause for concern, but um, we weren't seeing, you know, for instance, over half the groups on an aerial survey having at least one member with the disease. I mean, there was a lot of animals, especially, you know, probably 2013 to 2016 is when maybe we saw the peak in prevalence. The reasons for this sort of differential pattern in the disease when it got into Mount St. Helens aren't really understood, and they may not you know, truly be perfectly understood. But a reasonable speculation, um, at least in hindsight, is, is due to the background nutritional uh, limitation and condition of this population, sort of population-wide limitation. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, I think a couple of times about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And again, I think a lot of the folks in the audience are, are well versed in this history, but um, that eruption, you know, was a cataclysm that destroyed a lot of elk habitat, a lot of elk and a, and a lot of others, uh, a lot of other wildlife and was a, was a tragedy on a really large scale. But one of the outcomes from that was the creation of massive, massive tracts of early serial stands. And we, we saw elk recolonize that area. There was lots of replanting. And for that 10 to 15 year period post eruption, it was really, really high quality elk habitat. And, um, you know, really, you wouldn't have wanted to be an elk anywhere else in the world besides Mount St. Helens at that period of time. <clears throat> As the canopies began to close, however, um, well, and so I guess I'll finish up by saying we had a we had the population really grew and became very quite quite dense. Um, and you know the the Mount St. Helens elk population has this storied history of of really being one of the premium populations, and and really it was a destination uh, population for a lot of folks to come and view elk and to hunt elk. Um, but as that population, you know kind of reached its apex in density and the number of animals that were out there, we also started to see changes in those in the forests. And in that early serial stage began to transition into later stages, that 15 year period and onward where we have canopies that are closing, the benefits of those early serial stages in terms of forage started to become diminished um, while they're still active you know, forestry happening at that time. We also see some changes that happen on the federal uh, forest lands in the in the 90s. 
that reduced some of those forest management practices and civil cultural practices there. And so we see we have the forage resources becoming reduced, um, some changes at the federal level, some changes uh, on, on habitat sort of area, well, population area wide, but we have a very dense population. Um, so as the population entered into the 2000s, we, we, we started to see these sort of feedbacks, they're called density dependent feedbacks in this population where um, ungulates kind of have this, this tendency that if they, they can achieve really tremendous and rapid growth um, and overshoot their carrying capacity and meaning they overshoot what's available in terms of nutrition in the landscape. When they overshoot that, they can actually kind of hang out up there for a while, you know, just teetering around, you know, above carrying capacity. But when, they're, when that happens, you often see feedbacks of, say, low pregnancy rates. Um, you see uh, maybe low juvenile survival, and ultimately you might see the feedbacks in adult survival. That's kind of the last thing you would expect to happen. And those are all sort of functions because there's not food out there and it's a hard living and, and their body condition decreases. We started seeing that in the early to mid 2000s. We started seeing, um, it's a little harder to tease out some of the uh, productivity issues, but one thing that I think uh, is kind of always really surprising to me is that we would have winter mortality counts where we would encounter lots of dead elk um, you know, in March. That, that had died that year. And that's really not something that you see very common. I mean, even in extreme winters, like think about Yellowstone and other areas where you have really, really extreme weather, you don't have lots and lots of elk just tipping over unless they're nutritionally limited. So um, the, as, a, as we continue to document those, those limitations, um, and we began to try to manage against that and reduce the density of this population through harvest, the disease emerged and it really spread through this population quite rapidly. And it remains, prevalence remains highest in Mount St. Helens um, across the state. The, the, the disease unfortunately has, has spread in its distribution to affect quite a number of our populations, but prevalence still remains to this day highest in Mount St. Helens. And the nutritional limitations are probably highest in the Mount St. Helens elk herd. So we initiated some research in 2015 to try to investigate the impacts this disease might have on the survival and performance of animals uh, in Mount St. Helens. And so this is just an image here of, of you know, this landscape of the, of the mosaic of, of uh, the Mount St. Helens tree farm. And you can see the monument and the, and the mountain itself in the background. Um, during this project, we captured 180 animals, um, over 257 capture events. When we capture these animals, we monitor them for uh, we, we assess their body condition, we get estimates of body fat. That's what Dr. Mansfield here, our wildlife veterinarian, is doing. We, uh, we determine pregnancy status, lactation status, and of course we assess their hooves, and then we throw a collar, GPS radio collar on them to monitor these animals through time so that we can estimate their survival, which is really important statistic to understand the population dynamics, and also to understand why these animals are perishing or cause specific sources of their mortality. So I'm gonna breeze through a few results, but I think this is the one that I kind of really wanna show a figure on and, 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 and just underscore this nutrition. Right here, we're looking at um, body condition as estimated through percent body fat. Um, this, if we, if we just look at the, at the bins here, this is a box and whisker uh, style plot. And so in blue, we have animals that do not have the disease at capture. And in green, we have animals that do have the disease at capture. So we have in, uninfected and infected. And then on the left, you see we have them in pairs where you have animals that are not lactating and animals that are lactating. And I should have mentioned that we only captured um, adult female elk because they're really the drivers of the population dynamics. So what this shows you is the spread of the body fat of the animals that we captured. And you can see that those animals that are green in this box, this is the range of data of values that we saw. That bar there is kind of a good way to look at the central tendency, that's the median, um, of, of where we sort of you know, expect these animals to be. So you can see that overall, Animals that are infected with hoof disease in green have lower body fat. And animals that don't have the disease in, in blue um, have higher body fat. And this is a statistically significant difference. 
Um, and you can see that lactating animals on, in general have kind of a lower level, lower distribution, um, but it's muted for those animals that have the disease. They're already, you know, kind of, they're, they're, they're already in poor body condition fighting this disease. The effect of lactation, there's only so much further lower they can go without just simply falling over and dying. So, um, and one thing I want to highlight here is on the left, I've, I've sort of created a few bins here where you see poor, uh, less than 8% and marginal is 8 to 12%. And that's just sort of to say that, you know, if you put the words uh, uh, survival probability after that or whatever other <laughs> description is what you kind of find. So if you have less than 8% body fat, you have a really poor outlook to be making it through winter. If you have 8 to 12, yeah, it's okay. If you have less than 8% body fat, you have a poor probability of becoming pregnant. 8 to 12, eh, it's, it's okay. So that's kind of the relationship there. And that's what to tell you here is if you just kind of look across, well, none of the animals we captured exceeded even marginal body condition. Um, so that's important. That just underscores that background nutritional limitation, but that those animals that do have this disease, they, do, they are in lower body condition. It does seem that the effects of the disease have, a, have an effect there and, and reducing the, the body condition of the animal. And that just makes sense, right? You're fighting off this terrible disease. It's metabolically uh, uh, costly, I, you know, ener energetically costly to fight a disease off like this. So it makes sense that you're not going to accrue um, a lot of body fat going into winter. And so I've talked a little bit about, you know, how body fat and body condition really have important feedbacks down the line in terms of an animal's ability to become pregnant, to conceive, or even to go into estrus, and then raise the calf to, or bring the calf to term, raise the calf through summer. It has all these downstream effects. And I'll just show you a few things here. Ignore the graph for a moment. I meant to have that sort of transition in, but um, for those animals that don't have the disease, that are uninfected, we had an average pregnancy rate of 74%. Uh, whereas infected animals, this is just a, a, just a really surprising statistic whenever I see it, is 48% for those animals that have this disease. And that, again, just bears out this important relationship between nutrition and these downstream effects. Normally, you'd see that you know, quite a bit higher. It sort of depends on you know, uh, how many you know, yearlings and how many old age individuals you have out there, but it's not, it's not great. We would expect it to be higher for any elk population anywhere else. Um, for uninfected animals, it's, it's, it's a little lower than you'd want from a, a population you want to see growing, but certainly drastically low for those animals that have the infection. Survival rates were, were pretty similar. Remember I said, you know, you sort of have a poor probability or you have a marginal probability. Well, elk are really tough animals. So, you know, even with the body fat levels they're going into winter with, um, those uninfected animals still have about an 86% um, annual survival. And whereas those infected animals, those animals with hoof disease of all types of grades, because there is a bit of a spectrum of infection, it's 62%. In a normal population uh, of elk, you know, you're going to see if it's, if it's a hunted, you know, where there's female elk being hunted, you're going to see maybe 85 or so percent. Depends on your management uh, objectives if you want the population to go down or not. But you'd normally see something like 90 or higher with an unhunted population of 90% uh, survival for female elk. And then, uh, so that's just to say there that that 62% for infected animals is, is again, you know, really quite a bit lower than what you'd want. And these are ingredients of a recipe for a population that's not going to be performing very well and not gonna maybe rebound really quickly with these rates, depending on how many of those animals that you have that are infected. You know, the uninfected animals, they have so-so uh, uh, rates of pregnancy and survival, but um, those infected animals, if they comprise a large majority of the population, they're gonna be really weighing it down. So, Prevalence is really difficult to estimate, but um, we, we've come up with a few ways to do it here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the primary way that we do is through hunter reporting. And that's a, a more of an index estimate of what prevalence is. But nonetheless, it was 26% for the, for the Mount St. Helens of population in 2019, the core units. Um, down from 40% in 2016, so that's a good trajectory, and that was probably even higher in 2000, before 2016 when we initiated that, that estimator. But 
Um, I put the figure down here below to sort of highlight what that might mean for the population trajectory. So these are estimates of what the, of the population in the, the core of Mount St. Helens. We survey them almost every year, usually every year. COVID stopped us last year. Um, but you can see in 09 to 12, we've got a, a population that's pretty high, um, you know, so booms and busts. And that's, we, at that time, we were actively trying to reduce the population, lower its density to stem off some massive overwinter die off or whatever it might be to get the population back in line with, with its habitat. And then the disease emerged and that story began. And we pulled back on antlerless harvest, but we continued to see those declines. And in here, we see uh, a few really bad winters. And you can imagine you have a bad winter event like in 2017, we had a pretty rough winter. Um, you have a lot of animals that are in pretty rough condition and you know some animals that are in really bad condition. And that's gonna have some overwinter mortality and consequences for um, your dynamics. But the, the underscore here is really that the rates that we've mon that we've measured, we're still the next step of this analysis is to actually use projection simulations to see what might happen in the future if we're able to reduce the prevalence, say maybe to 15%. Um, what that might mean for our expectation as population moving forward, because um, you know we we all know how storied this the the history of this population is and what it what it might be able to achieve. We have a different habitat landscape that's out there. Um, but we'd like to see this population kind of tick back up and come back to more objective levels. Right now we aren't at objective levels in those core GMUs. And so if we're able to reduce and manage prevalence, we might see that tick up quite a bit more rapidly. And we might see it come up no matter what, even if population prevalence stays kind of where it's at. So to kind of try to wrap that up, uh, I know I've, I've sort of belabored a lot of this. The, the Mount St. Helens population overall is in poor sort of nutritional and these limitations have been documented before hoof disease and were well known before hoof disease emerged and that they were likely due to the effects of the, the eruption, the boom, and then the post-boom sort of feedback, the overshooting carrying capacity. It's not entirely clear whether the infected animals, we see that, you know, does the disease infect an animal because it's in poor body condition? Does an animal that's in poor body condition contract the disease or are they interacting? It's a bit of a chicken or the egg question, but I do think that um, based on what we've seen, you know, we have background nutritional limitations, an animal contracts this disease and it's even poor, it's an even poorer condition. And we don't see that really in some of the other areas where maybe we have elk populations that are in better condition. Hoof disease impacts um, might have the potential to drive the, the population decline. We're teasing some of that out with this analysis and, and um, you know, inhibit the future growth of, of this population. But unfortunately, most wildlife diseases, and especially hoof disease, are extremely challenging to manage. Um, there's really, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet, there's no magic solution, there's nothing we can really go out there and, and, and you know, we would have done it if we could have, um, but unfortunately, it's, it's here to stay, um, and we have to learn how to manage it. Um, and it's, I think, relatively low risk to assume that if we're able to enhance the nutritional landscape or enhance the individual condition of animals and the overall population level of condition, we may be better off in terms of managing this disease. Animals in better, that is to say that sort of animals in better condition, better body fat going into fall, not only do they have better outcomes for pregnancy and survival and recruitment and those important factors for growth of the population, but it also may stem off this, the, the infection from becoming infected or it may help them from achieving really severe stages of the disease where it's maintained more at an early stage. Some of that's played out a little bit in the, in the domestic livestock literature, and I think something that we'll probably hopefully learn more about, you know, as we move forward with uh, a lot of the research programs that are going on with hoof disease. Private timberland uh, harbors a large portion of the Mount St. Helens Oak population and is therefore um, you know, really important. Those civil cultural practices, forest management practices are really important for this population. And of course we zoom out and there, you know, these, these civil cultural practices are really important for drivers for elk across this region, the Intermountain West and the Pacific Northwest. 
and that you know when I think about kind of long term goals, um, you know, as as elk management and the department manages these populations, you know, we really have to think critically about integrating nutrition here and working with our cooperators, land managers, and, and in a partnership to try to be strategic about you know growing good elk habitat, achieving multiple independent objectives, finding that nexus where we all kind of win and we have good elk populations. So that's what I'm working on now um, and, and wrapping up this analysis, wrapping up this report. Um, it's, it's due in 2021 and I'm eager to have it out there and, and have folks be able to consume that information. And so with that, uh, here's some additional resources uh, about hoof disease specifically. We can share this presentation so you folks can view those. And hopefully we have some time for, for questions. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Paula. Thank you. Um, so we do have um, a question. So um, if any of you do have a question, since we do have um, 30 plus people on here, if you could just type them in the chat and then um, I will ask Kyle them. Um, so Bill asks, uh, for the body fat slide with the hoof disease, uh, what month of the year was the data taken? Early lactation, June to July? No, those, uh, those were taken in December. So uh, they're already, we're probably already seeing those estimates are a little bit lower than what you would expect to see, you know, October and certainly sort of that peak that we find in August or September. The majority of elk we captured in December, um, mid to sort of, you know, late December. And then we did have our, our first capture was in February, but I don't present those data because the, you know, the, the body condition that you're seeing in February, you know, it's, you can't really bend that with body condition that you see in, in December as well. And so the lactation, all those estimates are coming from, from December. Lactation is not necessarily that the animal you know, that is still nursing, um, but you can palpate uh, and, and see that, they're, that they were actively nursing um, a calf that summer and into the fall. Okay. Anyone else have any other questions? I don't see anything coming through. Um, if some of you haven't done uh, Zoom before, if you take your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little um, chat box. Um, and then um, you could type it in there. Um, so um, Judy asks, do we know how the disease is spread? Yeah, uh, uh, Judy, I, I wish I had a, a good answer for you that would be, uh, you know, uh, definitive and, and uh, you know, <clears throat> leave us all very satisfied with knowing how it, how it does move around. We don't know, um, you know, it, it, Dr. Margaret Wild at, at Washington State University uh, has a very sophisticated research program where they have elk that are in captivity and they're um, trying to learn more about how the diseases spread. I mean, they're, they're trying to learn, you know, fundamental, but extremely important to get the fundamentals on, you know, how, how does an animal contract the disease? What bacteria are there and necessary to contract the disease and also you know, how is it transmitted? I, I don't want to speak for uh, Dr. Wild's program and, and her research because I don't want to, um, you know, inadvertently mischaracterize any of their research plans. Uh, that is to say, though, that, you know, it, it's worthy of checking out their web page. They've got a great web page and their, their research is really exciting. But the disease is, is bacterial and it has the exact, almost the exact same microbial profile that we see in a disease of domestic livestock. It's called digital dermatitis or hairy heel wart or raspberry heel. Um, it's pretty common in dairy systems. There's a little bit more research that's happened there on trying to understand the disease and how it's been, how it gets transmitted. And it, it seems like there's pretty good evidence that it's transmitted um, often through the environment. And so in a dairy system, that would be through the, the slurry, the mud and the, the water and the urine, um, you know, it's sort of a great breeding, you know, broth for, for bacteria to grow in. And so a, and you have an infected cow, it's shedding the bacteria into that system, into that environment, and then an uninfected animal 
encounters it by just taking a hoof step down. So we could speculate that that's how it also transmits an elk, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, but there's a lot of questions on, you know, does it take, you know, pre-existing factors? You know, elk walk in really rough areas, do so they have little micro puncture wounds? Um, one of the things from, from dairy research, domestic livestock research, that uh, is often brought up is that these animals are in constantly wet conditions and you know just like you sit in a bathtub too long your skin gets soft and, and it's called maceration and and so the, that might allow um, being in really wet moist conditions constantly might allow bacteria to invade tissues and skin when they otherwise wouldn't be able to or at least allow initiating bacteria to get on there but um, and that 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 felt good to to say that you know, before we started seeing the disease in, in the blue, you know, we, we detected it in the Blue Mountains outside of Walla Walla. It's been detected in, lar in, in pretty ge large geographic areas of Idaho, uh, Oregon, and now Northern California, which is, you know, pretty wet place too. But I think that that still makes sense, but I think there's just a lot going on here in this disease process, you know, and there's a lot of bacteria involved and some of them, maybe initiate play good important roles in the initiation of the disease and then not play a role anymore as a as other bacteria um take advantage of that in, in initiating microclimate in the in the tissues and then invade deeper tissues so a lot to learn um and another thing too i think that you know we we don't know how it spreads but i i feel pretty comfortable saying that it isn't just elk moving the disease around um, maybe it went from elk to elk in Willapa Hills and elk to elk jumping over I-5 into the Mount St. Helens elk population. That makes sense. Uh, what doesn't make as much sense, uh, how it got from Mount St. Helens and Trout Lake to outside of Walla Walla in the Blue Mountains of Washington. <laughs> Pretty big sort of elk dead zone there. Um, so something else is probably going on, you know, and it's, and it may be human media. Um, it may be, it may frankly be spillovers from domestic livestock reservoirs where, you know, the disease in domestic livestock is present. I mean, it's ubiquitous in the dairy systems, um, you know, and causes, it's a major cause of, of lameness in dairy. So we don't know. Um, we have some ideas and unfortunately there's not a great solution, you know, uh, interrupting transmission would be a great solution to managing the disease, but we haven't quite figured that out yet outside of if you have, you know, the common sense thing of an animal is sick and it's depositing these bacteria into the environment. If you could remove that animal quicker, um, it may shed less and therefore it may infect fewer people. Um, you know, I think it's interesting now with COVID-19, a lot of us know a lot more about disease spread and disease transmission. <laughs> interrupt that kind of stuff and so a lot of the similar concepts apply here but um you know we we, we don't entirely know so okay a um, couple of questions from rick so I'll, I'll ask them each individually um his first was um was the 1970s reduction of harvesting in the federal forest part of the problem limiting elk browse well, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about um, forest management, you know, real, you know, a lot of details about forest management in the 70s. Um, I know a little bit more about it in the 90s when we started to see reductions in the activity due to the sort of the force, you know, the, the, the national level forest management plan and the and reactions to you know, concerns over spotted owls, marble murals, that kind of stuff. But um, Yes, I mean, I think that, you know, we're seeing across the board where we have reduced active timber management and harvest happening um, on large tracts of land and that, you know, kind of usually means the, the federal forest system um, that we're seeing less habitat be created, forage habitat being created and therefore there's just sort of feedback that, you know, it's just, you've, you've got to you have to stay on top of it. You have to, you know, the, the forest gets older and so you have to constantly be kind of resetting that, that forage window, that serial window for elk. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that question specifically, but I would say that in broad principles, you know, if, if 
there isn't very much active forestry and we're seeing um, closing of canopies, then we're probably seeing, you know, negative consequences for elk forage, um, you know, again, outside of like waiting for a few hundred years for old growth to establish. And then that's a different story, but we're, yeah. that's not reality anymore, so. Okay. Um, his second question, um, is there an elk disease that has developed in concentrated herds like Jackson Hole impacted our Washington herds? Well, uh, no, nothing that you wouldn't consider like a normal disease of, of elk, something sort of normally naturally occurring or something like, you know, parasites. Um, we are extremely lucky uh, so far to date that we do not have chronic wasting disease. Um, we don't have uh, brucellosis concerns. Um, and those are kind of the, the main ones that I would be, that would be pretty concerned about. So, so the answer is no, but a lot of those diseases follow um, you know, similar, similar patterns in terms of their difficulty to manage. So wildlife diseases are, are just incredibly, extremely difficult to manage. And, and we're, it's unfortunate we have elk hoof disease and many other places now do as well, but we are there's maybe a silver lining and we don't have hoof disease and chronic wasting disease. And I'm going to knock on wood. I'm not a superstitious person. But <laughs> okay. Um, from Bill, uh, he says your summary slide regarding drawbacks, including roads and herbicides. Previous slides showed benefit in quality and abundance after one to two years. This doesn't take into account the benefit to the establishment and growth benefit to tree establishment and growth, sorry. Certainly so, yes. So I'm, I, my thinking is biased and, and um, anchored by more of what's good for elk and not necessarily, um, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking of, of what's better for, you know, growing trees. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, the, there are drawbacks of herbicides from a elk forage perspective and but those drawbacks are short-lived um you know and, and there's even complication there because you know herbicides may affect composition of forage species that are out there that's masked a little bit by uh discussion of the amount of biomass that's out there and again i said that uh, plant species aren't created equal in their nutritional value to elk so uh, it's possible that you might see um long-term changes in composition that might not be good for elk and might last for the whole early cereal period. Uh, but overall, you know, there's still that benefit of, you know, stand level disturbance um, and, and creating forage for elk, even if uh, herbicides are applied post harvest. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um... And it looks like we might have just one last question here, and um, it's uh, from Rick. Um, he wants to know whether blackberries are palatable at all for the elk, and he's thanking you for your time. <laughs> well, thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I think that I think that they are. Um, we, I, I think they're going to be. You know, I mean, like huckleberry, things like that um, are, are decent food plants. Um, I would have to really probably do a little bit of research to tell you exactly how. <laughs> okay. And, and look at their digestibility and their percent protein and percent uh, digestible energy and, and that kind of stuff. But um, the blackberries themselves, I bet elk will eat. But, you know, the thing is, like elk are really adaptable. They can be browsers. They don't necessarily want to be browsers. So, um, Trailing blackberry, I guess, sort of fits a bit in the middle. Um, I'd say that they're seasonally probably important. The younger the leaves, the better. Uh, as they get older, they're going to have some secondary compounds in there that might inhibit uh, digestion and, and not be as good for elk. But um, I wouldn't consider that a highly important food resource, and uh, at least not the Himalayan ones. I don't think we want to encourage Himalayan blackberry any more than it already is. You know, reach out to me if you have questions. And again, really appreciate your time and inviting me to give this talk. And I hope you folks found it interesting and I hope you have a good new year.